potential to be the best and most important NGOs of them all. They're far more than the sum of their parts, and they have the opportunity, at least, to be far more than business models. But you know, most of the universities will scarcely recognize this title or may even be repelled by it being called NGOs, for they increasingly deny their true role and see themselves primarily as businesses, and thereby they fall into the very same trap as government. They too become subject to the channeling effect that we've seen. And furthermore, the business approach leads to unproductive and competitive pressures in university research, which takes us away from that free inquiry which we, th we, we realize is so important. The excess of competitiveness is leading to pressure to publish, paper after paper saying much the same thing because publication count is used to determine career progress, and this in turn can lead to academic misconduct, attempts to please, please the boss by getting a paper in nature, rife actually right now in parts of Asia and certainly not, own, not unknown in the West. No, if we really care for the future of humanity, we shall encourage the universities in their special and vital role and not just regard them as machines for invention and teaching. For it goes without saying that as well as research, the university's role is to teach. The students come to be educated, both for their own sake and for that of society, but in addition, they're the greatest moral resource that the universities possess. They're mostly young, they're uncommitted, they're often idealistic, but also realistic. And if they're allowed, they'll help the universities to rise above the short-term interests that try to control them, and they have a personal interest in shaping the world that they, and in turn their children, will inherit. I'd like just to mention one example of this, it was demonstrated in a very striking way at Yale in 2001, when a group of students conducted a campaign to provide more egalitarian access to an HIV AIDS drug called Stavudine, which had been developed for research done at Yale. Now, remarkably, the students were successful, and the contract with Bristol Myers Squibb was renegotiated so that the drug was made available to countries where there were previously no sales, because it was unaffordable. So nobody lost out, the company lost no profit, and of course gained goodwill. And this event led to the founding of the student movement called UAEM, which is not only an effective pressure group, but also is an important source of information and a forum for discussion, a sort of NGO in its own right. Now activities of this kind greatly enhance the university's role in discussing and contributing to policy in the widest sense. And all this is good, but for it to work, the university must be and must be seen to be a trusted source of information. A further adverse consequence of the trend to profitable activity is the loss of non-aligned experts who are needed for good policy making in a highly technological society, but are difficult to find if everybody is bound up in vested contracts. Reliance on statements of conflict of interest is not an effective solution. For example, clinical trials have frequently been written up with a favorable bias by marketing departments and then published under the names of senior professors who are thereby reneging on their duty to give people good and independent advice. Now, I've discussed at some length the university's potentials using health as an example, and the conclusions apply equally to the rest of the green agenda. University's job is not usually to conduct large-scale development, though management research and contribution to policy is important. In terms of innovation, their role is to research freely and try to ensure that the products are made widely available, the route that UAM is promoting and should be followed for all Greek technology because it needs to be widely shared. We've already seen how universities have unique potential in this regard, but the countervailing forces are pushing them back. They have a vital role in collecting data and modeling 
for example, their major contributors to the international pa inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, without whom we would still not have solid evidence of the anthropogenic causes of climate change. In biodiversity, too, we need the university's databases and we need funding to maintain and implement the findings in an open fashion. In food supply, the first great revolution, the first great green revolution of plant breeding, hugely successful in averting famine for a generation, widely predicted to occur, was done in the public domain by universities. And I seriously doubt whether the hoped for second green revolution will be as successful as the first if it continues to be bound up with intellectual property, high prices, and lack of transparency. We need publicly funded crop science departments in universities to make this work properly and distribute the fruits equitably. And so the list goes on in energy, in water, in demography. The sparks must be struck in the universities the nurseries of human culture before the products can be rolled out. And underpinning all other aspects of greening is this need for improved governments, to governance. Somehow, we need to find a way to square the circle of democracy, which despite all its faults, is our bulwark against autocracy, with the need to plan and act on a longer term stage than democracy mostly manages. And here, of course, I'm moving out of my comfort zone of natural science into the territory of humanities. Perhaps my early remarks about ignoring the ancients no longer apply here, or perhaps they do with even more force. The need to reality check our concepts, our roadmaps, with what's actually happening. But in any case, it's in the universities that new paradigms will be formed. So if I can just be allowed a few more minutes, I want to ask the question, why do we want a green agenda anyway? Many of us feel that greening is sufficiently, even amply justified by our role as stewards of the earth. And it's also necessary for our own survival. But of course, if we weren't here, or if there were a lot fewer of us, then there would be no issue. I have no time to talk about population today, but I just note that our sheer numbers are the direct cause of all the other problems. But then, since we are here, does it actually matter whether humanity and its moral descendants survive? Of course, we're here because we, well, most of us anyway, love life. We want to continue in order to get more of it, and we want our descendants to have it too. But aside from all that, are there other, any other, other reasons for us humanity to survive? Now, the first point to register clearly is that we are the uniquely intelligent life form on the planet. Notwithstanding the many interesting studies on intelligence of other primates and birds, which help to illuminate our origins, we've taken a step change on the evolutionary path. We've somehow gained the power of transcendent thought and combining our individual abilities through communication and records, we've hit on ways of continually growing our knowledge and expertise so that we're now progressing in a way entirely different from biological evolution. It's now the evolution of ideas and skills that counts, no longer dependent on the slower workings of genetics for the generation of novelty. And one consequence is that for good or ill, control of the earth is in our hands. We must face up to our responsibility as the most powerful organism of the earth. Now, not everyone is happy about this. Quite a lot of people, and these are the real pessimists, think that we've made such a mess of our remit that we'd be better all round if we don't survive. They feel that our species is hopelessly morally defective, will never be able to form a society that's stable, peaceful, and just. And it's true that our track record so far is not that great. But consider the alternatives. 
I hear mention of two scenarios going forward. One is that having become extinct, like the dinosaurs, though unlike them through the use of weapons of our own construction, we shall in due course be replaced by evolution of another intelligent species, maybe a dolphin, maybe a corvid. But how long will it take? We've already taken half the age of the Earth in getting to this point, and we have no idea how likely or unlikely the development of high intelligence is. Alternatively, on this scenario, a few of our kind may linger on, as portrayed in many a science fiction plot. But then, remember that not only will records and skills have been lost, but also we have already dispersed the most accessible ores and other necess necessities so that reindustrialization will be much more difficult the second time around. A second scenario <clears throat> is that the universe is teeming with a myriad life forms originated independently. And that for some reason having to do with physics or maybe with the choices of the aliens, uh, we haven't actually spotted them yet. And so anyway, in this view, the loss of our own kind doesn't really matter. It's just another life form in the universe. And some suppose, amazing number of people suppose that the probabilities are such that intelligent life must have developed many times. They even do calculations about it. But actually, we have no idea of any of the probabilities. Now, that position of ignorance may change. It most likely will change through scientific discovery. But at the moment, we simply don't know. And therefore, our working assumption, not for all time, but our working assumption ought to be that we're alone in the universe, or multiverse, if you like, because so far, we have no shred of evidence that there's any other intelligence anywhere. It is conceivable that the development of our abilities and our prospects has actually not been duplicated anywhere else ever. We don't yet understand the origins of thought, of reasoning, of creativity, and until we do, or come across other examples of them, we should treat our origin as a precious and just possibly unique event. Now, such a conclusion is very uncomfortable for scientists who are more accustomed to handling reproducible situations. And I don't even suggest that it's very likely. But the point, once again, is that we have no way at all of estimating those probabilities. And under the circumstances, apart from all other considerations, a vote for collective an annihilation is crazy. On the contrary, the onus on us to survive, to survive in good shape, and to flourish is high. And bear in mind that if we can do that, we're not short of time at all. Our existence is a mere pinprick on the age of the Earth, which still has a few billion years to go, if we let it. And anyway, we should soon be in a position to move a few of us out to spread our options. The drive to ever faster innovation for its own sake is a false goal. It's an artifact of crude economic systems. Now, this position is far from pessimistic. True, it gives us responsibility to survive and not make any more mess in the process, but on the other hand, life is so much fun, there is so much to do, let's not throw it away. We have a whole universe before us to explore. Potentially our future is limitless. But I look to the universities to give us the chance. Thank you. Thank you.